In this segment, The Life and Ministry of Jesus According to Luke. The Gospel of Luke has always been believed to have been written by a man named Luke, who was a Gentile doctor, someone who worked with Paul and the other apostles, according to the book of Acts in the Bible. Most scholars believe that this same Luke also is the author of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, which is the fifth book in the New Testament. It comes right after the Gospel of John. This Gospel starts well before the life of Jesus. The first main character is John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. The birth of John the Baptist is predicted by the angel Gabriel, who appears to John's mother. He predicts that John will be a great prophet, and so he is in this book. His mission was to call Jews to repentance, to turning from their sin, by, it says in chapter 3, quote, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, end quote. He also, as a prophet, Luke says, warns his people of impending judgment. He says to them, quote, even now the axe is being laid to the root of the tree. He says that he's not the Christ, he's not the Messiah, but he predicts that the Messiah is coming soon. The next really famous scene in the Gospel is the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary, who is a young Jewish woman, who is a virgin, and who is engaged to be married to Joseph. Quote, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. End quote. Jesus, according to this passage, will be the Son of God in the sense that God caused his mother to become pregnant, not in the ordinary way, but just directly by divine power. The Holy Spirit comes upon her. He exercises his omnipotent power to bring about the existence of Jesus. This famous interaction between the angel and Jesus' mother Mary is the source of the famous Hail Mary prayer, which is used in Roman Catholicism. This was a later development in Christianity. It developed over the course of the Middle Ages and became a lot more popular in the ten hundreds than it had ever been before in the West. In the translation I just read, the angel says, Greetings, O favored one. A more archaic translation is, Hail, Mary. Hail is a greeting. According to this gospel, she was a virgin when she conceived Jesus, and she was a virgin after she conceived Jesus. Whether she lost her virginity at some later point after his birth is another matter. Jesus then did not have a human father, according to this. You don't want to confuse the virgin birth of Jesus, that is the miraculous conception of Jesus, with the immaculate conception of Mary. The immaculate conception of Mary is a doctrine that was made official in Roman Catholicism in the year 1854. That's when it was a made official teaching. Of course, people had come up with it before then. This teaches that Mary was free from sin and filled with God's grace from her conception onward. The idea is that she had to be healed of the sin that is in all human beings so that she wouldn't pass on sin to Jesus. Roman Catholics believe that she remained a virgin ever after. However, the Gospels do mention Jesus' brothers and sisters. Catholics say that, well, those words can also mean cousins. Protestant Christians believe that those are children of Mary and Joseph that the two of them produced after Jesus was born. Back to Luke's story, a Roman census calls Mary and Joseph back to his hometown of Bethlehem. There they had to lay him in a manger in a feeding trough for animals because there was no room for them in, many scholars would say, in the living space of his relative's house rather than in the inn. Luke says that angels appear to shepherds nearby and tell those shepherds that, quote, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. After Jesus' birth, they take him to the temple in Jerusalem, and as required by the law of Moses, they sort of buy him back by giving a special sacrifice there for one's firstborn child, and they have Jesus circumcised. In the Jerusalem temple, they meet an old prophet named Simeon, whom God had promised that he would be able to see the Messiah before his death. And basically, he says now he can die happy. 
And also they talked to an elderly prophetess, a woman named Anna. About Jesus' childhood, the Gospels tell us very little, and this Gospel is no exception. Luke says, quote, He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was with him, end quote. And a little later, Luke says that Jesus, quote, increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and with people, end quote. The traditional assumption is that he was learning Joseph's trade, that Joseph was either a carpenter or the word could also be translated as a stonemason. So the assumption has been that Jesus, as a boy growing up, would have learned some of those specialized skills. Only one incident is really reported from his later childhood. It's when he's 12 years old. His family visits Jerusalem and participates in one of the yearly festivals there, and then they set off to go back home, and they accidentally leave Jesus there. And a couple of days later, they go back. They're all worried that they don't have Jesus with them in their traveling party. They go back, and they find him there, and he is disputing with the learned scribes about the meaning of the Bible in the temple area. And when his parents come back and say how worried they've been, Jesus says, Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? After that, the book skips to when Jesus is all grown up and he's about to embark on his public ministry. First, he's baptized by John. And when he's dunked by John, it says that God's spirit, that is God's power, comes down upon him, quote, in a physical form like a dove, end quote. Many people speculate that this was a kind of turning point in his life, that it was at this point that he knew that he was to start his ministry, or maybe even he discovered what the point of his life was at this time. And at this baptism, there's a miraculous endorsement from God. A voice is heard that says, You are my son, today I have fathered you. Or was that what was said? There's actually a rare textual problem here. Some of the Greek manuscripts say what I just said, and some of them say, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Some scholars would argue that the first reading, which is less like the other two synoptic gospels, less like Matthew and Mark, is more likely to be original, whereas the second one I gave is a result of a copyist harmonizing what Luke says with what the other two say. Sometime after this public baptism, John is imprisoned by the ruler Herod and is eventually beheaded by him. Jesus at this point undergoes a period of testing and temptation. He spends 40 days alone in the desert, and he's approached there personally by the devil. And it doesn't say in what form, whether he appeared in the form of a person or, you know, this monstrous winged creature like here, or whether it was just a voice in his head, it doesn't say. In Luke, he tempts Jesus to tell this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. If you're really the Son of God, Jesus refuses to jump through that hoop. Interestingly, Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if Jesus will only worship him. That's interesting because it seems to imply that Satan owns the kingdoms of the world. And third, he tries to get Jesus to throw himself from the top of the temple. This artist imagines a big monster, Satan, you know, physically carrying Jesus up to the top of the temple. He dares him to throw himself down. Won't God rescue you if you do this? And Jesus says that wouldn't be proper to test God in that way. The bottom line is that he resists temptation, he doesn't sin, he remains submissive to God. And after this, his ministry proper begins. It says that he teaches around the region of Galilee in synagogues. As a Jewish man, he had a right to go into a meeting like that and stand up and speak at the proper time. He took advantage of that to start to preach his message. He even goes to his hometown in Nazareth, where he reads a prophecy from Isaiah. He basically claims that he's the Messiah. And he makes the crowd really mad. They say, no, this is just a local boy. We don't think he's somebody special. And he narrowly avoids being thrown off a cliff. According to Luke, in chapter 6 and 7, he heals a number of sick people miraculously. And he casts demons out of people. This is all supposed to be a demonstration of God's power and a kind of divine endorsement of his ministry and his message. And then, after praying over it, in chapter 6, he handpicks 12 apostles the word apostle means messenger. He's picking his apprentices, people who are going to be his special students and live with him and learn everything that he teaches and practices. What is his teaching then? The overarching theme of Jesus' teaching in Luke and also in the other synoptic gospels is the availability of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the reign and rule of God. It's the realm in which God's will is done. Anyone can get into the kingdom of God by repenting and by becoming Jesus' follower. 
It says in chapter 8 that he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in the Synoptic Gospels is here and now, but it's also a coming reality that God will bring an end to the age of evil and will take over. And so there is a suggestion that you can get on the winning side here. This kingdom is not to be established by force. He disavows that in chapter 22 when he's arrested. But it'll come about by the miraculous power of God is the idea. This rule of God has standards of goodness that go far beyond just observance of Torah. He teaches that you have to love your enemies, that if someone slaps you, you have to turn the other cheek and let him slap the other one, rather than to punch back twice as hard. There's the famous golden rule, treat others as you would like people to treat you. He teaches that his disciples should be kind, even to the ungrateful and the wicked. He says, do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven, because the standard you use will be the standard used for you. A distinctive feature of Jesus' teaching is concern with hypocrisy. It's not enough to be good on the outside, you have to be good on the inside. You can't pretend to be pure and not be pure. Jesus says every tree can be told by its own fruit. He tells you that it's ridiculous to try to take a splinter out of your friend's eye when there is an entire log in your own eye. Jesus in this gospel boldly demands that people should follow him, that they should obey his teaching. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? He says, if you build your life on his teaching, it's like building your life on an immovable rock. He says, you even have to hate your family by comparison. You have to take up your cross, your, which cross represents execution and death. You have to take up your cross and follow him. And he even says in chapter 14 that following him requires giving up all that you own. Also, acting as a prophet, not unlike John the Baptist, he pronounces God's rejection of those Jews in his generation who reject him. Some of his fellow Jews in chapter 7, it says, rejected the prophet John as possessed. Like they claimed that he was demon-possessed, and they reject Jesus as a glutton and a drunkard, presumably because he wined and dined with sinners. He says that his twelve apostles will sit on thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel, which is a startling claim. He's talking about here when God's kingdom has fully arrived. Another striking thing about Jesus here is in chapter 7, he claims that he can forgive sins. There's a consistent picture of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels as a skillful teacher who uses everyday examples and short, memorable stories to communicate things that are easily remembered. In the 15th chapter of Luke, he gives three famous parables to teach about God's mercy. He talks about a shepherd that has 99 sheep that aren't lost and one sheep that is lost. And the shepherd, he says, will go and try to find that one lost sheep to leave the 99 that aren't lost behind. He also gives the example of a woman who loses a gold coin in her house. She'll stop everything she's doing. She'll turn over the whole house. She'll turn everything upside down until she finds that coin. And when she finds it, she's overjoyed. She calls her neighbors to celebrate. And most famously, he gives an extended and moving story called the prodigal son. In this parable, basically an ungrateful son squanders his inheritance on wild living. You know, basically, he goes to Vegas and spends every last penny on hookers and booze and gambling. And then he comes crawling back to his father and asks if he can just be a servant in his father's household. But the father rushes to greet him and embraces him and forgives him. Obviously, the father represents God and the prodigal son, this wayward, ungrateful, ridiculous child who totally didn't deserve forgiveness. He represents me and you. Another distinctive teaching of Jesus, this is in chapter 22, is that he teaches leading by serving others as opposed to dominating others and being the most powerful. He says, the greatest among you is the one who is a servant. In another place, he washes his disciples' feet to model this for them. In our next segment, Jesus' suffering, execution, and resurrection.